So Steve Chen. Sure. All right. Um, I, hope, I hope the slides will go live. If they're not, I'll just read off of them. Um, I believe my charge was to listen to this first very, very interesting uh, hour and 40 minutes and quickly alter some slides that I had and raise questions that had come out of the discussion and the terrific presentations. And hopefully, are we going to go live? Or? All right, good. The first thing I wanted to say was we have to think about what we can do and what we want to do. And those are two very different things. And the next couple of slides, hopefully, will give us that ability to begin to do what I think Eric put in his first slide, which is develop the guidance for NIH for deciding who, when, and why to sequence at this point. And we really have four major elements of sort of hearing in the discussion here. The technologies, the choice of technology, when to plug in, when perhaps to re-plug in, the well phenotype studies, and then I think Peter raised a very important question, how do we actually analyze and call the variants? That's a very unstable world for a good part of the genome. And so the availability and having these spaces where we can continue revisit and improve things in the iterative nature, I think, of, of genome sequencing and analysis is critical. And then, of course, the availability with adequate consent. So if we go from the general to the very specific considerations and thinking about mapping diseases and traits, let me throw up a first set of questions for the group to think about tonight and then tomorrow. Starting with pilot or pilots, uh, here we know that they're very rich sample sets where we have multiple outcomes and we can certainly come up with compelling scientific questions. But it's the third and fourth bullets, I think, that are important. The economy of scale and developing a process. These things are going on in other studies, as Peter showed, you know, some, you know, thousands of individuals being sequenced elsewhere. But if there's going to be a large scale, a much larger scale effort towards a million sequenced genomes in a, a million wealth phenotyped individuals, we have to think about the economy of the scale of how we develop that process and how we feed into that particular process and then the validation thereof because the error rate is a real issue. And it really gets at this question in, in moving to the larger studies of really thresholds. As we all know around this table, the history of genetics is thresholds. Just what can we eke over statistically or in enough members of a family to find something? The question here in thinking about this, do we have to think the Hail Mary pass boldly and go with a few phenotypes uh, to a much larger number to be able to work backwards and hide a subset of those individuals and say, with what real accuracy or precision were we able to discover what we're interested in? Power calculations are one thing, but the difficulty of calling and looking at errors and phenotype heterogeneity and phenotype errors really raised this, I think, very important question of thresholds. And we would think of that in terms of different effects and frequencies. And then certainly the pipelines, the kinds of pipelines that have already been talked about today. Genetic pipelines are absolutely crucial, determining which particular technology and then how we would analyze those. And then the problems in calling is, is suggested down here. If we just take the genotype error for, for doing an Illumina Omni Express chip, you know, 0.01%, and if we just apply that to the genome as our best tool, so to speak, for genome sequencing calling, we're still looking at 300,000 errors. Now, most of those errors are going to be in places we don't really care about, but some of them may be in places that we care about. And I think this is an important... PR issue that we face in talking with the public. If indeed, you know, people are used to, to tolerating only a very small error with respect to clinical judgment. So I think that's a, a very important issue that we have to think about. And then, of course, the posting of that information. So let me talk about the strategic use of the technologies. We've already had a very nice talk from Rick about where we are with respect to exomes and whole genome. And the question I would put on the table is, for some of the studies that we start with, we would want an availability at least to consider revisiting those samples with supplementary technologies as we may see, whether it's with PacBio or somebody else has a way to fill the rest of the exome or fill the rest of the genome, that at some time we can get closer to saying we've looked at 98, 99, or 100% of the genome 
as opposed to 85%. And I think this is going to be very important in constructing and understanding the models that we have, particularly in cancer, when we look at all the GC-rich regions that we can't sequence very well, uh, and the amplifications and deletions that take place, there's certainly you know, small hints that in many of those places of the genome, there's very rich relationships with, with cancer. The second is targeting high-profile regions and thinking about follow-up confirmation, how we would do that. And then the new genomic spaces, as we think of the question of detectable mosaicism with sequential testing of individuals, whether, you know, in seeing that the genome is not quite as stable as we thought necessarily over time. Certainly epigenomics, some diseases like retinoblastoma in childhood. It's very interesting that it's really the epigenomic change that's been identified and not many somatic mutations that are very important in understanding that disease. RNA analysis certainly comes on board. And then I think right now we're just about to have a huge crop of fabulous papers from the ENCODE. There are 18 that are coming out in genome research and a couple in nature, and they're really a spectacular sort of convergence of understanding what the space of the genome really looks like. And I think out of this, we're going to see places and things that we may want to target and think about in looking and understanding phenotypes better. I, I, I at least want to put that on the table as something coming downstream in, in terms of being able to use that information to better look at the three dimensions of the genome as opposed to the current maps of a physical map that we think in more one or two dimensions. And then the analytic questions of some versus many in a particular data set, so depth versus breadth is another way of looking at that. But I would like to put on the table, at least for discussion, the possibility that we choose a couple of phenotypes that we would be sure are common to everybody that's getting sequenced. Again, coming back to this threshold issue that if we had somewhere, you know, if we had 500,000 people sequenced that we had a BMI and some other piece of information, we would then, I think, be able to much better begin to really dissect what we really mean by genomic architecture and, and exceed by an order of magnitude what we would really need to identify different types of variants with different effects and the like. And I think that's something to think about sort of superimposing over the thought of how are we going to prioritize. Are there some embedded questions that will be of tremendous methodologic and analytic uh, value to the community? Certainly the development of pipelines with reference sequences, Rick raised, is just so important and seeing even that dynamic change does have real implications for what we call and how we call them. Certainly the cost of analysis, central versus distributed. Uh, I think we all would like to be distributed, but there is a role for a certain amount of central to be sure that we develop the right pipelines. And then the sequence data is really hard to test agnostically. And it's the value of the laboratory correlations as we get to rare and rare variants that become more and more important. When you look at exomes and you see 18,000 variants you've never seen before and you start categorizing them, to really interpret them, we're going to have to use other information and that, that's, that's that annotation of results that's really important. So let me just say, I hope that long term we can think about a goal that this this whole discussion would move us towards a million well sequenced genomes and a really a million well phenotype subjects that would be able to converge at some point in the not too distant future. Certainly this is not going to be the only contributor to that, but we have to think big in terms of being able to do that with the ideas of recontacting and improving our lifestyle and environmental exposures. And we really live with two paradoxes that I want to end with. One is that we are trying to infer individual insights per person from large studies, and we know we need larger and larger studies to get to rare and rarer events. And these denser data sets, as cool as they are, are analyzed by fewer and fewer people. They just have more and more difficulties and challenges in a lot of the analytic pipelines. And so, you know, I, I, I fully believe that we have to think about democratizing the analysis, but it is a real challenge how many people really can go into the cloud and do the things that really need to be done. So there really is a gradient there that I think there's an educational part of this project that needs to bring more and more people into that world and give them the facility to be able to look in creative and different ways. 
let me end by just saying I'm here in Wilson Hall. It's named for a dis different Wilson, but there was a great president of the United States who made a very important comment on collective intelligence. And he said, I not only use all of the brains I have, but all I can borrow. And to me, this is a call for the collaborative nature of working together to solve these problems. And it's certainly fun to see everyone around this table here. And now the time is really to get down and roll up our sleeves, as Woodrow Wilson say, and get at it. Okay. Great, thanks. So, so um, I, I think we want to have discussion in the last five minutes or so amongst everyone or, around the room. Um, Stephen did, did raise a, an, an interesting issue, and you're welcome to come back and yeah. join us. I, I, I got my marching orders to take. You make me nervous when you're standing up there. Um, about denser and denser data sets that can be analyzed by fewer and fewer people. That's a, a really great point. And, and so how, how can we address that in a, in a reasonably effective way? Is that, is that appropriate? Is, you know, do we want to make data sets that are, that are so complex that, that they will give us the answers we want, but only very few people can handle them? Or are there other ways of, of kind of getting this cat. Uh, 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 hi, Mike Knowles from Chapel Hill. I'd, li I'd like for you to think out loud for just a few minutes in, in, in terms of your concepts of new genomic spaces. Because it seems like these new genomic spaces that you talked about, epigenetics and you know, encode data and, and those kind of things um, may well be, you know, vitally important in moving to the next step from plain old sequence. And so what I'm trying to do is ask you to think out loud about how you envision taking lots of genomic sequence and addressing those particular areas. I have, an, I have a specific example, which I'll talk about tomorrow, but, but how do you think about that in the broader context? I, I, think it, I think about it in terms of where we were talking at the very beginning here about the, the phrase, the biology of the genome, I think has several different uh, connotations. And as we move from a physical map you know, we had genetic maps and then we created physical maps that gave us an opportunity to sort of see the position of places. And now we line those up and use various fancy tests to statistically link them with outcomes. We still don't have that third dimension of time and of space. And, you know, whether it's the, some of the interesting epigenetic observations in diabetes or, you know, uh, in cancer, certainly those should be put on the table. But in looking, I mean, I I've I've have to say I've had the privilege of being able to review 18 papers from the ENCODE at the same time and write this perspective. And it's really absolutely fascinating to see and read all these things and, and think of the genome in three dimensions as opposed to two dimensions, the way in which we use it. And we mark by one dimension or two dimensions. And so I'm, I'm not sure where this is going to go, but I, to me, we, we have to think about that. And at some point, come back to the question of what does CTCF occupancy really mean in time, you know? Uh, and this is where the ability to look at genomes more than once, whether it's, you know, detectable clonal mosaicism, which we know certainly is occurring with aging, or whether there are other functional things that we're going to be able to start to analyze in large or small scale. I, I don't know on what time scale we'll be able to do that. but I think. We're going to learn an awful lot because the genome is not flat. It's three-dimensional or it's really four-dimensional. And we, we currently look at it as two dimensions and we try and make a third dimension, but we, we, we only do so well with associative and, and linkage analysis. So, you know, the question is, are there going to be new ways of organizing or wanting to hone in on particular things, methylation patterns or whatever? in the context of inflammatory bowel disease and someone who's got active disease versus early disease. I mean, these are, the, to me, these are really, really fascinating questions. And the sequencing in the cohorts gives you the opportunity to visit some people more than once. Well, sequencing has been called a recently disruptive technology, and I think Steve's point about the, um, you know, these data sets can be analyzed by fewer and fewer people bring home the point that we are going to have to think about new ways of 
moving to new ways of storing and analyzing data. And Eric raised the point, um, clouds are one way to think about that, but we're gonna have to be much more creative to make sure that people remain as engaged in the analysis of sequence data as I think they would like to be. Um, that this is something that biologists need to be able to access the information, um, not just genomicists, not just statistical <coughs> geneticists. Um, we, ha we have to find ways of serving results of the studies, serving up the data, making computational space available to people. Just to add one thing to that. I mean, I think the scary thing is the tidal wave of non-academic interest in sequencing and genotyping with 23andMe, people getting their personal genomes, you know, it's not very long before Googling your genes may be not a catchphrase, but a, a real challenge. And as academics, you know, the challenge is how do we stay in the middle of that and not become you know, peripheral to the interpretation and the use of, of genome data. I just Mayor wanted to, uh, oh, Mayor go ahead. Uh, in terms of this issue of sort of fewer and fewer people being able to kind of deal with uh, heavy lifting inside the analysis of these data sets, I, I'm actually not concerned about this problem. The uh, most biologists are uh, are going to need access of the type I think Nancy was mainly emphasizing. Uh, it is going to be, uh, the, the field's going to become more specialized and more stratified. All scientists do this as bec they become more mature. There were, there were never very many people actually who knew how to do uh, whole genome assembly uh, or uh, annotation, large-scale annotation of genomes, uh, but there are an immense number of people who use the results of this kind of calculation, and that, that's what we're going to see here. You never want to centralize anything more than you have to. Uh, but. Some aspects of this will be centralized, and others will simply be largely dominated by a subspecialty within our field that really concentrates on it. One person can do a lot sitting at a computer terminal if, if uh, he or she really knows, you know, knows what to do. Uh, so it doesn't all have to be centralized. I just um, following up on Nancy's comment, um, the. Um, one thing that was discussed at the aggregation meeting a couple of weeks ago was, was making um, results more widely available from, from these analyses. And I think that that's one thing we, we, that might be added to the checklist of, of Steve's outputs that, that would be considered. I mean, really making widespread results available. We've talked about how some of the GWAS uh, large studies don't really make the, all of the results available, including the negative results, which actually are very important results to have available. So that's one thing. The other, the other point I wanted to make was that the phenome, not just the genome, the phenome is very important for, for um, uh, these types of studies. We learned from the exome sequencing program within um, the, uh, with, uh, funded by NHLBI that when you, when you aggregate uh, results or, or data from, let's say, seven, ten or, or more cohorts, the harmonization of the phenotypes is, is a critical step that, that was sort of not really paid much attention to but turned out to be a, a time-limiting and rate-limiting step. And while it's very unglamorous, it's actually terribly important in terms of making those types of data available widely. So I just would add that to the list as well. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. everyone. This has been a great sort of evening snack of brain food to get people <laughs> engaged for tomorrow. Unfortunately, I'm going to give you homework, though. You know, if you, you realize that we, we have these two main charges of, of thinking about the questions that can be addressed and then thinking about criteria for identifying cohorts. Now, I think just because this is the first day of class, let's just focus on the first one. If people could email me between now and 6 a.m., just, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. So if everybody could email me about one or two questions that you think are important for, you know, looking forward, you would like to see addressed from um, a large-scale sequencing of, of, of a collective sample sets. And, um, I will try to put the, those together for tomorrow morning and develop a theme of, of several questions, just so I, you know, we will have something that can seed the discussion. Feel, well, I'm sure we'll shoot it down and edit it throughout the day, but I, but I do think it's important we return 
to our, to our, our basic charge. So please email me. It's eric.borwinkle at uth.tmc.edu. Okay? What's the question? <laughs> what's the question? The oh, what's the assignment? Yes. The assignment is go back to the charge, and one, of, one of the two charges is to identify questions that can be addressed or should be addressed for large scale um, sequence, or sequencing in large cohort studies. So to help design it, these are sort of use case scenarios, if you will. You know, in designing something, what, what will it be used for? What kind of questions do we anticipate that we'll um, try to ask of, the, of this sample set and phenotype information? Yeah, you're talking about uh, scientific, scientific questions. Scientific questions, absolutely, yeah, scientific questions. And, and I think if we have a list of, of broad, visionary, scientific questions, that's going to help us think about how we should design it, what it should look like. Okay? So please email me and I'll try to synthesize. Yeah, and I, I would just note that Eric was, was copied on the note that you all got that, that transmitted the um, uh, June 5th and 6th workshop uh, report. So, so you have his email address. There's, that's no excuse if you couldn't write it down that fast. So, Do a reply uh, to all. That'll make everyone yeah. happy. <laughs> that's right.